equity, vigilance, and advocacy. You are listening to The Brave Files, real stories from people living courageously. You can listen to the show anywhere you enjoy podcasts, and we'd love for you to subscribe, rate, and give a review on Apple Podcasts. It really does make a difference, and we appreciate it. Now, here's your host, Heather Vickery. Hey, everybody. It's Heather Vickery. I'm so glad you're with us today for this episode of The Brave Files. Over the last several years, particularly the last two years, I have learned a lot. I've learned a lot about privilege, both mine and others. I've learned what it truly means to be an ally, to listen, and to support. I've learned to be a better friend and a better community member. I have also learned that my voice has power, and it's up to me to use it properly, not just for myself, but for everyone around me. So that's why I'm welcoming my friend and a community member, Kisa Marks, to today's show. Kisa has a story to share, and it's one that can't be truly heard or appreciated without her voice doing the speaking. I'm here to learn and to help her share so that we can all rise up and do better by our children and our communities. Kisa, welcome to the show. Hi, Heather. Thanks for having me. <laughs> you sound so mad to be here right now. She's nervous. She's not <laughs> I'm, mad. Not, I'm so happy. <laughs> You're like, hi, Heather. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, I'm grateful for you having me and allowing me to uh, tell my son's story and our family story on your show. Thank you so much. <laughs> You're welcome. I needed to loosen you up okay. just a little bit. No, but this is a serious topic, folks. I'm not trying to make light of it, but I, <laughs> um, I want you to know I didn't force Kisa to be on the show. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> All right. So here's the thing. I can never, ever understand what it's like to be a mother to black children. I am not a black mother. Mm-hmm. Um, hell, I can't even understand what it's like to be a mother of boys. I have all girls. Yeah, it's fun. I I will just take your word for it. <laughs> Don't scare me, but I won't be saying that when all of my kids are teenagers. Right. Um, but you're both. You're both a mother to boys mm-hmm. um, and black children. Mm-hmm. And that has to come with its own its own whole set of of rules and ways of being and raising and supporting something that I could never ever ever understand can you maybe speak to that for just a second yes so being the mother of three black boys is living in a constant state of anxiety You worry when they leave the home in the morning. You worry when they go out to parties. You worry when they're on the road. It's just nonstop. And it doesn't matter. You can live in a bubble. You can be in the suburbs. There is no place where one will feel safe. When you It's it's a whole different level of fear. I mean, I worry about my kids all the time. Mm -hmm. If I can't see them, I'm worried. And yet I'm not worried that that they're going to, and this is the story we're, we're turning into, you're going to be um, unduly stopped or yes. frisked or arrested yes. or shot or any of those things. Um, I'm not. I have little blonde girls. Yeah. I'm not worried about that. There are a lot of other things I'm worried about. But yeah. Um, so there, there's the maternal worry that we always have with our children. And then, like you said, there are these other factors that, only a certain population has to deal with. And and you worry about your child being searched or your child being confronted by, by someone. It's just, and it's nonstop. It never ends. Right. Yeah. I, w- I, I, want, I want to say I'm sorry. I mean, I am sorry, mm-hmm. but that seems like such a stupid thing to say. Like I, <laughs> I, I just not. do what I can do. Um, yeah. So can you share, first of all, what are your son's names and ages? So uh, my oldest son's name is Shaheem, and he's 20. I have a middle son. We have a middle son, Christopher, who's 17, and Jalen is 15. And they all have birthdays coming up. They'll be 21, 18, 16. Oh, my gosh. Yes. Wow. They all have birthdays in the same month? Um, Christmas Eve through January 10th. Okay. So, yeah. All right. Weeks apart. Yep. Wow. That's intense. That's a lot yes. of celebrating. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and New Year's. <laughs> Holy cow. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, uh, which one of yours, I mean, I know that you probably have a, a million stories and I hate to even 
say that, but I know it's true. But right now there's a particular situation that is urgent and prevalent. You want to share um, which son this is about and what's been happening? This is about my youngest son, Jalen, who's 15. He's a sophomore at the high school. Okay. And we are, you want me to just say it where we are? Oh yeah, sure. We're, mm-hmm. This is, we're talking about Oak Park River Forest High School, which is the school that my kid is due to go to next year, by the way. And I'm, woo. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So what's been happening? I mean, school's only been in session for what? Six weeks? Six weeks. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So at the beginning of the semester, there was an altercation uh, incident where uh, my son and a group of his friends were stopped and detained. They were searched. You know, they want to see if they had any drugs on them. My son did not. Um, what precipitated that though? Why were they stopped and searched? There was the suspicion that they were under the influence. By so, what? Their 15 year old teenage boy behavior? There was, they said their behavior was off. They looked like they were under the influence, uh, things like that. So Uh, they they took them all aside. They searched them. There were four of them all together. Um, Jalen did not have anything. His friends insisted that he was not under the influence. Uh, He was given uh, this consequence. They said they only, they did, they did not test him. I'm sorry. Even though they stated that they had drug testing on site and it s- says it in the code of conduct, they did not, they chose not to, for whatever reasons, they said all they needed was the suspicion in order to uphold the consequence. So he, such bullshit. Yes. <laughs> so he was given a three day suspension. <gasps> um, he lost his homecoming privileges. He lost, um, he couldn't go to the homecoming game. He couldn't go to any events, high school related events until after homecoming and he loses eight out of 16 games in his basketball season. He's on the basketball team. I, so, okay. Yes. So yes. do they call you? At what point are you alerted to the fact? And also let me ask uh, without making an assumption, all four of these boys were black boys. They were not. They were not. They were not. That's where the story gets very, very tricky. Not that it so, does. <laughs> three of the boys were white boys. Jalen was the only black boy. Oh, hell no. So, Tell yeah. me that the other boys got the same punishment. So they so they got an identical punishment, but these boys confessed to being under the influence. So this was a totally different thing. Oh they said, hey, God. we did this before we got to the school. We realize now that was stupid. We'll take our consequence. He was not involved. And they wrote statements and they, you know, spoke with their parents and everything else. And no matter what, it was kind of like a guilt by association thing. So we understand that we want him to be accountable. We weren't fighting the connection with his friends. Okay. We were, we were fighting the fact that if he was not under the influence, why is his suspension identical? Why is his consequence identical? Yeah. So we, so um, we were told, okay, well, if you take this suspension, then we'll um, we'll stand with you when you appeal so that they can cut down his basketball season. Just a note that my son lives for basketball. He loves everything about it. Yeah. So we were willing to go with that because that's his center. Later on down the line, we find out, no, because of IHSA rules, the athletic department it Mm -hmm. has it's statewide it has nothing to do with the school and so there's no fighting that so we were stuck with extreme (laughs) consequence plus we could not change the fact that he loses half of his basketball season off of something that he was never proven to have done and it was just simply guilt by association this is um do you know um, omar yamini he's a community member do you know him i do not know him personally but i have heard of him yes yeah so that was i mean clearly a whole different level, but his guilt by association landed him in prison for 15 years, which is total and complete bullshit. Okay. So uh, back to my other question, at what point in this process are you alerted that they have stopped your son? They have searched your son. They have not tested him and they've punished him for something that they don't have any real grounds for doing so on. Two hours later. Seems like a long time to me. That is an insanely long period of time. I spoke with my son. We have horrible signals in the high school. Um, For those of you who live in the village, you know it's a dead zone when you go in there. And so I was supposed to meet him to take him 
uh, to basketball practice. And I couldn't get in touch with him. So I didn't think anything about it because of the connection issue. Then I receive an email from a teacher, I mean, from a dean who tells me, oh, we have your son. This has happened. Please call me and come up to the school. Oh and yes, yeah, so I'm I'm furious because these are teenagers. So yeah. in my in- instincts tell me this is true. Why, you know, they right. tell me so you're ready under to the influence. Because <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes. So he, this is not my first trip to the rodeo. This is my youngest child. So as soon as they said it, I said, okay, let me go and, and deal with the situation. But when I get there, I look at my child and he is not under the influence. His eyes are clear. His speech is clear. He's extremely verbal about what's going on and, and how he feels about the situation. So I say to the dean, well, I'm looking at my child and he's not under the influence. And he says, oh, we don't think he's under the influence, but we think that's because he's the drug distributor. Oh, fuck that. Why? I said, I'm sorry. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. yes. So I said, "Uh, um, you know, how so? He tells me, well, we found he had a backpack in the backpack. There was a Gucci wallet um, with the price value of three hundred twenty seven dollars. And we found three hundred and sixty dollars in cash. So my instant response is we only give this child Chipotle money. He's not (laughs) carrying her around. Right hundreds of dollars. And um, so later, sometime, and now this is what the dean repeats to me, but sometime during this, the two hours that they had him, they found out that the money belonged to, to his friend. The friend verified it, the parent verified it, but they still brought it to me and said he was the drug distributor. Why was he holding the friend's money? Do you know? Yes. So when they rode up to the school, um, you know how kid, the kids ride two on a bike? Yeah. Jalen rode on the back of his friend's bike. And because of that, he was leaning against the friend. So he put the friend's backpack inside of his His backpack. backpack. So he had both backpacks. He had both. Yes. But it was already verified before this dean told me that my child was a drug dealer. And (laughs) so he said, "Okay, well, he's not. He did. He didn't distribute the drugs, but he could have gone to we could have arrested him for theft. Again, how so? If this is his friend and the friend and the mother verified that it's his cash and he had it and he gave him permission to carry it on his back, how is he stealing? So then he went from that story. And this is all in a matter of about five minutes. Of course. By any means necessary to accuse and punish your son. Yes. So the final result was, okay, he's not under the influence. He did not distribute the drugs, but he's going to face the same penalty because he um, exercised poor judgment. And that was how we wound up in uh, the principal's office talking about the, the situation. I, we tried to appeal it. Uh, We were told by Principal Rouse's secretary that he did not have time to deal with the situation, Mm -hmm. that he was going, they were going to uphold the suspension. And, but he didn't have time to either call me or deal with the matter himself. So we went to the school, we had asked for an emergency meeting. We got there and it was very tense things. Uh, he was very short and abrupt. And basically the, 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 there was a wall up. I could not get through and say, Hey, this entire thing has been mishandled Absolutely. from the, the lack of communication from how long you had the children from the, the, the fact that you all have drug testing on site threatened the children with the drug testing, then didn't use the drug test. Right. Which would have solved so many problems. I I guess it would be a moot point. Because they they didn't care. They didn't care that he wasn't of the influence. They didn't even think he was, which is why they didn't test him. Right. Because then they wouldn't have been able to make their stupid, not make a Exactly. Exactly. And then I was gaslighted. I was told, well, this is not, this is not a, a drug lab. We don't test the children. But the dean in question said that we have drug testing available. And it states in the code of conduct that they have 
drug testing on site. So I'm not sure why they brought up, the, like, like I was just saying, why didn't, you know, this was just some arbitrary thing. Why aren't you drug testing them? You stated that you could, but you didn't. So it was a very odd situation. Following that situation then became the constant scrutiny from the security guards. Everywhere my son went, a security guard was following. If he entered the bathroom, a security guard came in. If he went to lunch, they were they would hover around his table. They would follow him in the hallways. And it just got to be, I'm not sure at what point it got it got to the attention of my child that he brought it to us. Yeah. But when he did bring it to us, it was at a level, it was at, a, at an extreme level. Um, if he was a second late for class, he was getting taken to a dean to be searched. He went to the restroom. Um, he received permission to go to the restroom, uh, went in there, ran into some friends of his brothers, talked for a second like kids do in the bathroom. A security guard came in as they were walking out. He gets back to his classroom, not long enough to even raise the attention of his teacher. As soon as he sits down, security guards come in and say that he has to be go to a dean. They take him to the dean. They search him. They say it was because he was in the bathroom with two or more people. That's not a rule anywhere in our code of conduct. No, and I mean, it's a school with thousands of kids. There are yeah. going to be two or more, <laughs> more people, two people in the bathroom. <laughs> yes. Yes. So at, at that point, we were just done. And this is where you decided to get the community involved, right? Or is it even further down the story? So I filed, this was shortly before, right before that. Okay. I filed a grievance to which I received radio silence. It, there was not a sound. No one responded. There was no, not even from my dean. There wasn't a response from my dean. There wasn't a response from the counselor, excuse me. No response from Mr. Rouse. No one from HR who you send the, the grievance to. And I do understand that there takes, there's a 30-day process for the grievance until they receive a result. But a parent that is in distress should at least receive a follow-up. response, yeah, response. absolutely. I would Tell me you received this. Yes. Yes. <laughs> But I didn't. Yeah, I don't even like it when a, a vendor or a coworker doesn't say, got this, I'm working on it. Like, yes. we're talking yes. about the life of your child. Yes. And so at that point is when I decided, you know, this is just us. You know, my husband works two jobs and I have a daycare. And so we're constantly, you know, in order to battle, we're going to need help. <laughs> yeah. It's just you know, there's strength in numbers and, and the voice gets louder and, and the squeaky wheel gets the oil. So I decided to turn to members of the community and let them know what was going on so that together we could get attention from the powers that be. Okay. Mm -hmm. So tell us what I, I, I know because I was involved, but nobody else knows. So let's mm -hmm. uh, tell us what happened. You how did you connect with the community? What did you ask? And then, and then what transpired? So I was completely distressed at the time that I reached out and I just kind of pinpointed the things that have been going on with our family and with my son in particular, how stressful it had been, the things that they were doing. And I tried to say it in a way that everyone could understand that whether you were black or white, no one would want this to happen to their child while in school. Right. We're not talking about being in a gang. We're not talking about on the street. We're talking about in your school. These are, this is not supposed to be going on. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I sent out a letter kind of call to action to the people in my community, my support group, and ask them if we could all get together and, and create a day where we put the same amount of pressure on the administration as we felt as a, a, as a family had been put on our 15-year-old child. Yeah. So that means constant scrutiny, yeah. constant questions, interrogation of just all day. This is what he experienced for a month. 
And so the objective was to apply pressure for just one day between the hours of nine o'clock in the morning and 2.45 in the afternoon. And hopefully that would receive a response <laughs> so that we could move forward and, and figure out a way to change the, the policies that created this type of negative behavior in the first place. How many people do you think participated in this day? Oh, in my introverted world, it felt like a million. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know a million people, but certainly because of our community and um, yes, <laughs> I everyone that I know, yes, participated. Yes, um, everyone hopefully. that I know participated. Yes, so it was overwhelming. Hundreds. Yeah, the amount of support that we had. And I received calls from strangers. Um, I received emails from strangers like, hey, we got this and, and we support you. So it was it was unbelievable the amount of support that we received. I do want to talk about what the school's reaction to that was, but did that do was that helpful at all to to bolster what was happening in your family and for Jalen? What did that do for you all? if anything? It was beyond what we even imagined. So I wanted to get the attention of administration. I wanted to let them know that I am not going away. This is my child and I'm willing to do anything to right this wrong. Yeah. And, um, or stop it. Like stop yeah, to bleeding. stop it in its tracks. Yeah. Yes. So that was my simple request. But what it did was there was this wave and all of a sudden my emails just opened up. I received phone calls. Oh, there's the principal here. Oh, oh, here's HR there (laughs) sending me an email back. And everybody was ready. I received emails from teachers and social workers and all things that I had been trying to put in place since the beginning. Now the wheels were turning. And I think that was because they realized that this was bigger than me. They you know, with, I said this to you that yeah. week before. I said, they messed with the wrong family. Yes. <laughs> because yes, everybody I loves you <laughs> to love her. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, all of those things they should have done up front. And yes, in the first place. Mm-hmm. Very frustrating and mm-hmm. makes me very angry that yes. it took all of this. Mm-hmm. But they did say something. So what has opened up since then? What? What's been different? Has anything been different? Well, um, after the, I just want to note that after the grievance was filed, there was an incident with a security guard where he came and he verbally um, assaulted my child. He oh, was hell no. yes, after it was filed. Af- this was after. Yes, what the did week this after. Man say to you um, he came to the table. The kids were eating. They weren't causing any type of a disturbance or anything like that. He came up to the table. He asked Jalen's friends, like, why do you hang with him? You know, why do you all like him? The friends were kind of like confused. And one responded because he's our friend, you know, why not? And so Jalen at this time is just over it. Yeah. And he responds like, you know, why are you here? He says some uh, very colorful things. And, <laughs> Which you can't uh, so blame the kid your... for. Like you can you only be yes. abused so many times before you lose it. It's yes. the way it is. Yes. So he, I'm trying to think of the cleaner way to repeat what he Go said. Go ahead. So, so he said, why are you dick riding? Which is, <laughs> yes. So, I, I got it. Yeah. So, to which this grown man security st- staff, he walks away and he comes back and says, that's not what your mother said to me last night. Oh my God. In, in front of a table of children. So, so at this point, oh we were just infuriated. And now I just want to add that Jalen did not come and tell us this. His friends actually did Sounds because like they were mortified. Yeah. But I, I think that speaks to how much he had been taking that he that just, he just didn't even bother saying, yeah, he just didn't even bother. But those friends were like, Nope, this is going to your mother. <laughs> and so, Good for them. Uh, yeah, I was very proud of his friends and, and very thankful that they were there 
and willing to say, hey, I am a witness. I saw this. Hey, if they have video cameras, they can probably see it because it happened right in the lunchroom. So they were very, very helpful in that situation. Okay. So was that part of, you said it was after the grievance. Did you bring that directly to the powers that be? What did they have to say about that? Yes. So then I followed up and I was at that point, that was when they hadn't yet uh, responded to my, to the grievance, to the original grievance. And I told them, Hey, while I'm waiting for a response, this is happening. It's nonstop. This is not going away and it's not letting up. And then I did receive a response back from the head of HR who, who you send the, who you address the grievance to. Mm -hmm. And um, that's when she told me that they were looking into this and they were taking it very seriously and um, they would follow up and principal Rouse would follow up. Did they? Um, There was, there was follow up, but there was a lot of placing blame. Oh, I thought your Dean would have followed up with you and the Dean the dean says, well, this is an issue. Uh, I can't remember whether whether it was an issue with security or, oh, no, no, no. The dean, there was an issue um, another with another child, another student that was going on. And then we just missed each other. So everybody blamed something else. But in the end, it, it was the matter was never addressed. So. So no. no. Yes. Yeah, so no. So the answer a bunch was of, no. a bunch of um, <laughs> talk. Nobody yeah. did anything. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's, I um, just yesterday I went to pick up my daughter from the middle school to take her mm-hmm. to a dentist appointment, mm-hmm. and you have to go into the office to sign them out. And first of all, why are all those people mean? If you guys work in in a school administrative office, can somebody mm-hmm. just talk to me? I, I I have some friends. Actually, I have a friend who listens. Jen, if you listen, you're lovely, and I know you used to work <laughs> in an administrative <laughs> office. And I mean, why can't more people be like you? they're mm-hmm. not nice these people no are nice. no and mm-hmm. there was a child and I'm trying to remember because I was focusing on my child and I was not looking around but I could hear these things but I do think he was a young black man mm-hmm. um, but I, and there was an adult speaking to him now I couldn't tell you it was a, a female adult but I couldn't tell you what race that that, that adult was mm-hmm. but he was clearly in trouble but the tone of voice and the things that were being said even the nice things that were being said were said in such a, a mean and an yes. angry manner yes. that mm-hmm. I was infuriated. Mm-hmm. And when we mm-hmm. got in the car, I called the principal and yes. I said, I am a parent who observes and you need to know how these administrative people are talking to the children in the office. And I do not care who they are. Mm-hmm. And I do not care if they have done something to be in trouble. How are we going to raise a generation of empowered and healthy children if we talk to them like they are insignificant. Exactly. I cannot understand it. He, to his credit, he was like, okay, what do you know? And I didn't know much. I said, I, mm-hmm. I wasn't looking. I was listening. I don't know, mm-hmm. but I heard this aggressive language and mm-hmm. um, I'm really appalled by it. And he did say, or we could have just been mouth service, but he did say, I am grateful that you called and brought this to my attention. I guarantee you we will, will be addressing this. But I also said, mm-hmm. You know, my kid is a really good kid. She never, ever gets in trouble for anything. And mm-hmm. she's terrified to come into the office because yes. of the way people behave. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. why are kids terrified of the people there? That's not and There shouldn't be this feeling of this dreadful feeling when Jalen was approached by one of the security staff, which was completely out of order. Two people addressed him. One came in a positive way and said, hey, kid. I never thought you were a bad kid. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, he went on. And then another one came and was like, oh, you know, I'm mad at you. You got my friend in trouble. And I don't care whether this was intended to be nice or because later I did speak to her and she was apologetic and everything else. The way that the environment is set up, these kids are on guard. They are. He doesn't know you and he is threatened by you. And it's because of the way that they're perceived. They come off very gruff and really aggressive with the children and they don't know what to do with you. And this goes beyond you. Yeah, it's beyond you uh, doing your job. You're doing more than that. And that's why they feel this way about you. Okay, so after the day of action, did you have a name for this day? What did you call this day in your mind? 
um, I don't, I don't think I gave it a name. It, I wish I had now that I just kept saying it's the big day. It's the, the big, big day. day. So <laughs> after the big day and you get all these emails and you finally get the responses that you deserve to have gotten mm-hmm. weeks ago, mm-hmm. what's happened since then? So it's been kind of like an episode of the Twilight Zone. So when we went in for the meeting, there was this expectation that we should go up, you know, go in with our guards up. Um, The the correspondences after that between myself and Mr. Rouse were very, very tense. And so we went in. Is that the principal or the dean? Yes, that's the principal. Okay. So I went in expecting it to go one way. Uh, when we got there, there was a lot of polite behavior, lots of smiling, lots of we want to hear your voice to Jalen. And it just felt insincere because the reason that we were there was because his voice has been completely silenced for the last month. So I wasn't sure what was happening and who was an ally and who was pretending to be that. and. It was just this unsettling feeling the whole time. His grades were brought up as if uh, his grades precipitated that t- type of behavior from the security staff, as if they knew. It was it was very, very odd to have something happen to your child and then have his personal behavior brought up as if it, it was the reason why they were doing this kind of victim blaming type of Yeah, it sounds like thing. it. Mm-hmm. And then there was the notion that they just wanted him to be accountable. But I found that odd what, because we were sitting there asking for adults to be held accountable. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Saying- and yet they're, they're <laughs> upset with your son who, who they think isn't being accountable. I yes. mean, look, we do, there is some sort of social accountability. You got to mm-hmm. be smart about who you're hanging out with and what you're doing. Mm-hmm. But we mm-hmm. also all make mistakes and children, children need to be able to be children and learn they and do. grow. And that's the whole damn point of being in school and learning how to engage in a society and make good choices. Mm-hmm. Cause you got to fuck it up. Yeah. Sometimes do. to get it right. And you know, I mean, hopefully not mm-hmm. in a really big way. Mm-hmm. And I'm not excusing anything that's dangerous or, but, but your kid didn't do any of those things. He was just a kid. Yeah. He was just being a kid and making poor choices and learning as he went along. And so that was the thing that we made sure that we constantly said, this is not an effort to avoid discipline. It, if, if he did something wrong, even if the wrong thing was poor judgment, then let him take his bumps. You know, let him take his licks. We're fine with that. The issue is that what happened afterwards, if the if they're saying that the issue is who he's hanging with, his poor judgment, then how come these boys were never followed? How come these boys yes. were never searched? How come these boys aren't being targeted at the lunch table? And so, how come it's only this one? Right. And that's so that's the question I have too. Um, Jalen got into this quote unquote trouble, which I call bogus anyway, Mm -hmm. was identified as not being under the influence, not Mm -hmm. dealing, not Mm -hmm. stealing, not doing Mm -hmm. any of those things. And yet Mm -hmm. he receives this constant persecution and judgment. Did those other boys who happened to be white boys who had the same punishment, Mm -hmm. did they experience any of that profiling? They have not. These are boys that sleep on my couch every weekend. These are good, good, good kids. I love them to death. They're my extended sons and they are open and honest. And the only thing that I have heard is the only time they are stopped by staff is for them to, by uh, security staff, is for them to ask, where's Jalen? What's Jalen doing? Why are you with him? Those are the only questions they receive from security. Why do you have to get your kid? That's what I don't get. I need so if you've never stopped him and found anything, you're just convinced that he's up to no good and you're going to keep staring at him until you find something. Okay, so we can't get more into this question I'm about to ask, which is a big question. Although I, I would like to encourage those of you, and is it on Netflix or not, America to me? Mm-hmm. Is it? How do you access it? Is oh, it's it, not on Netflix. It's on Stars. Yes, it's on Stars. 
Mm-hmm. Is there a way to get it if you don't have stars? No. You can, I think it's on Amazon Prime. Okay. So yeah. America to Me is a documentary that actually mm-hmm. follows this very high school we're talking about. Mm-hmm. Um, so the, I, I want to let listeners know, go, please go and watch this. This is important. It's really, it's a, it's heartbreaking and humiliating that this is our community, but it's mm-hmm. important. It's, it's not just our community. So mm-hmm. I guess the question I'm going to ask in the very short time we have left is, mm-hmm. is this unique to Jalen or is this the average young black man's experience in this high school? I would say this is the average young man's experience at the high school. I went there in 93. My twin sister went there as well. My sister is in the documentary. My nephew is in the documentary. This is not new. This is what made me so vigilant with the school because I know the things that they did and I wasn't willing to let that happen again with my children. Yeah. Makes me feel physically ill. Yeah. What can we do, the allies, the the privileged white folk, the, anybody, what can any of us do? And, and I'm using that term and I mean it. I use that term with my kids. It is mm-hmm. important, you know, there's a lot of power in that and you can mm-hmm. ignore it, which makes you dangerous or mm-hmm. you can use it and do something yes. valuable with it. So how yes. can I use my privilege to be helpful? You can do exactly what you're doing by being your wonderful self, oh, well, but you your friends, <laughs> everyone around you, my friends, speak up. We all know this isn't right. We all know that this is something that should not fly with anyone's child. So don't be complicit. If you see that it's wrong, open your mouth, share that information, call the school, leave an email, keep on bringing it up until we can force some sort of change. Yeah. We all have the right to those things that are best, not just a certain group. If we all go to the school, let us all get it. Yes. 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 I, yes. I can't enough. Please, folks, please don't be complicit. Don't just stand by and say, because it's not happening to you or your kid. Right. That it's not your business. It has got to be your business. And I am at a point mm-hmm. in, in the world where I'm quite angry with everybody who stays silent. You don't yes. get to stay silent anymore. If yes. you choose silence, you are part mm-hmm. of the problem. Yeah. I don't usually get this big and this political mm-hmm. in this show. So if any of you mm-hmm. want to get feisty with me, bring it because I'm not scared. Uh-huh. Um, <laughs> we I, can argue. Let's do it. <laughs> I suspect that I, that I have a pretty progressive listenership, but I don't know who's out there. Um, yeah. But you know what? If you don't understand what I'm saying, if you mm-hmm. don't necessarily agree, but you're open-hearted and open-minded enough to talk, let's mm-hmm. talk about it. Talk yes. to me. Mm-hmm. Because nothing's mm-hmm. going to change without conversation. And if this is, if you don't understand why it's important for you to speak up, mm-hmm. then let's have a conversation about it so that we yes. can create real change and have real, real dialogue. Yes. Uh, you know, it feels silly to me to ask this question uh, based mm-hmm. on the intensity of this conversation and what has been happening in your family's life and especially your youngest son's life. Mm-hmm. But throughout all of this, how have you worked to spread empowerment for him and joy and put some grounding love in and around this? Um, how do you do that? And then how do you celebrate anything that's good when there's so much that's difficult? So this was rough. Uh, There was, uh, it was so stressful, but I'm of the belief that you can always find power in any situation and you can't just, you, you have to find a way to become empowered. So the way that we taught Jalen was that you have to speak your truth. You have to say If you do not agree, then there is a way to say you do not agree. You can refuse that search. You have rights. And I think between um, informing him that he had support and that his voice was valid, then he found strength in that. When we did the, the open letter, 
he asked, could he take it to school? And I said, well, you know, this is the tone of an adult. It's you know, written for an adult. But he was so proud of it yeah. that there were people willing to support him and back him up that he wanted to take play a part in it. And that. so and he yeah. has every right to want to be yeah. proud of that. The fact that the community came together to support him. That's yes. Yes. If only we could do that for all of these young men. That is my wish that I want to support everyone. This is not just about my child. This is about the children. Mm -hmm. So it specifically affected us today, you know, in this issue, but this has been going on. I love though, that he, that there is that pride and joy coming from him, which is taught by you. You've Mm -hmm. you've given him that gift. Mm -hmm. Um, even when things seem difficult to know you are loved yeah, is mm-hmm. a game changer. Mm-hmm. And I honor you as a mother. Oh, thank you. For that. <laughs> um, well, clearly Kisa and I could talk for a very long time, but yes. we need to, <laughs> she's got a, a, a little pile of toddlers she needs to get back yes. to. But, um, <laughs> so I get to ask a question that I, I am curious to hear your answer to this question because I love this question. And I think it's, uh, deeply rooted in in how we're going to make the world better. What is your mm-hmm. favorite charitable organization to support? So I, I thought, I'm, I'm thinking long and hard about this. It wasn't too long ago that I needed help in different ways. You know, I had my children very young. We didn't have a lot of money. And so I was the recipient <laughs> of a lot of charitable organizations. So the way that I give back is um, person to person. I collect bikes and we send it to working bikes. I, I um, give back at Christmas time. That is really what I do now. I would love yeah. it to, to be on a larger scale, but for now I'm doing those things that, that helped me when, when I was growing up. When I was yeah. growing up, I could see how the kids stole a lot of bikes around them, but it was because they didn't have bikes. And so <laughs> if we can give them bikes, they don't steal. Bikes. They wouldn't steal it. Yep. What's the organization so, what's, that you do that through? It's called Working Bikes. Working it's bikes. on 24th and Western. I love that. Yeah. I think so. I collect bikes. If I find bikes and nobody comes, you know, I'll post it online. Did anybody lose a bike? If they don't, then they all automatically goes to the donation basket. And so we can get these kids bikes so they can stop stealing bikes. Yeah. <laughs> so. Absolutely. There's always more to the story, right? They're, yes. not, just, they're not just bad kids. Yeah, there's always something. Yes, there's a reason. I love that. And I honor keeping it local. And there's something really magical about being able to be the person that supports your community after Mm -hmm. having been the one supported. This is how it is supposed to go. Yeah, it's supposed to be full circle. Uh Yeah, when somebody gives you a hand up, you then Mm -hmm. are hopefully able to give one to someone else. And that's really what it's all about. Yes. Kisa, would you share your three words with us one last time? Sure. Equity, vigilance, and advocacy. I don't know why that comes out so weird. Advocacy. Advocacy. It's mm-hmm. a tricky word. I yeah. think that they're great. Uh, and and equity, I mean, wow. Yes. And then there's a whole nother episode in, in equity. E- equality doesn't equal justice. So we can find mm-hmm. that another time. But equity, yes. Um, mm-hmm. Especially with what you're talking about. And vigilance is so powerful to me. That's... Um, that and advocacy, like you have to be in this with your children, yes. for your children and for everybody mm-hmm. else's children. You have to mm-hmm. pay attention and be loud and don't stand on the sidelines mm-hmm. and get up. I, I introduce myself to the parents and I say, I'm going to be your loud parent this year. Yeah. I'm going yeah. to be really paying attention and you're going to hear from me a lot. And I'll try to really hard to be nice as I do it, but I'm not. Yes. I'm not standing back and they know what they're getting into. Um, Yes. So friends, I I just, I can't stress enough how important it is to be involved in your community, to stand Mm -hmm. up and speak up for your neighbors and your children. We Mm -hmm. have to all be in this together. Yes. Your fight has to be my fight and my fight has to be your fight. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Kisa, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Heather. All right, friend. So you guys, This is Heather Vickery. I love having you on this journey. Thanks for listening. This was a big, hard, detailed, heated interview. And I think it was really important. That's why we did it. So this is Heather Vickery reminding you, as always, to choose bravely.
The Brave Files is proudly supported by Lost Format Apparel, a socially conscious clothing company. You already know that homelessness is a huge problem. Over half a million Americans are living without shelter and millions more without consistent access to everyday basics. My friends at Lost Format know that solving homelessness is a much larger problem than any one company or person can solve on their own. It requires teamwork, sacrifice, strength, and building communities through personal and professional relationships. And isn't that exactly what the Brave Files podcast is all about? That's why I'm proud to say that the Brave Files has partnered with Lost Format. And together, we're working to change the face of consumerism in addressing homelessness. You can now get one of two fantastic shirts custom designed specifically for the Brave Files. Each order goes towards providing necessities to the homeless. We have one shirt that, of course, says choose bravely and another that reminds you that brave is always greater than fearless. Head on over to vickeryandco.com store to see both beautiful shirts and to check out the entire product line from Lost Format. All of their stuff is super soft and comfortable and has an amazing fit. Use promo code BRAVE to get 10% off of your Brave Files custom t-shirts. And if you have an order over $30, your shipping is free. I choose bravely to take the plunge to help solve homelessness. Are you with me? Thank you for listening to The Brave Files. Be sure to visit thebravefilespodcast.com to access the show notes and discover fantastic bonus content. Music composed and produced by Matt Lewis of Union Music, LLC. Special thanks to our editor and audio mix expert, Andrew Olson. I am eternally grateful for all that he does to make each week sound so fantastic. You can hear more of Andrew's work at findandrewolson.com.